Welcome, everybody. Welcome. We're going to get started here. I'm sure people will trickle in. But my name is Alex Walker. I am with um, the Department of Neighborhood Services, and we're organizing this Lunch Learn series so we can help the community um, do some more community development. And so today's topic is going to be on the topic of tax increment districts, TIF districts as well. <coughs> and we have Rocky Marku going to present on that topic for us today. <laughs> Here's Alderman Cox. Good afternoon. Um, thank you all for coming out uh, today. Uh, the Lunch of My Series is something of myself, Alderman Rainey, and I bring you greetings from Alderman Rainey and Alderman Jose Perez, who couldn't be with us today, um, who also as graduates of the Acre Program the Associates in Commercial Real Estate, we became all the people we deal, I think we all sit on zoning and neighborhood development together. And we thought about what gaps could be filled with the education that some have already received about real estate, about city functions, and what this, the role the city could play in um, great development of our neighborhoods and our community. Um, Working with the Department of City Development and Department of Neighborhood Services, we came up with a series of Lunch and Learns. This is our second year of doing um, Lunch and Learns. And it just so happens that this Lunch and Learn fell during Bronzeville Week. Um, so you are sitting in Jewel Caribbean Restaurant in the heart of Bronzeville. So I thought, you know, part of the renaissance you see going on along King Drive and in the Bronzeville African American Cultural and Arts District is about the development. It is about um, the real estate and what's happening. Um, so why not take it out of City Hall and bring it right here into the heart of Bronzeville as a part of Bronzeville Week. Today you will hear from um, some city leaders about different ways to access and create and what a tip really is. Um, and hopefully you'll take this information and share it with others and utilize it to help us um, help to continue to rebuild Milwaukee to be the best city that we all know it has the potential to be. And with that, we would like you all to go ahead and get something to eat, and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, okay, so the lights have gone down. That doesn't mean the prices are going up, though, okay? <laughs> We're in Bronzeville, and um, it's great to be here today. I really appreciate uh, Alex organizing this. Uh, he's done a, a lot of these lunch and learns, and as all the women cogs noted already, uh, a number of her colleagues, most specifically Alderman Rainey and Alderman Perez, uh, and herself are Acre grads, so we're really, really excited to hear about that. And uh, I think what's interesting about the Acre program, I love the Acre program, and I think LISC is doing a great job with it right now. It was birthed out of Marquette University. Uh, which is my alma mater, Dr. Apley, uh, Dr. Epley, and then uh, a number of the local developers actually helped to build that curriculum. And it's turned into a really great opportunity to change the landscape in Milwaukee, to change the development landscape in a meaningful way. Right now, our city, if you look at our citizenry, the majority of our citizens are women and men of color. Yet that is not what we see in our development community for the most part. And I, I think in order to change development patterns, we really need to change developers, right? It's not to say that the developing community right now is not going to keep developing. They are. But we need to bring a new group of developers in that looks more like our city and reflects some of the values that the developers want to see in the neighborhoods as well as in downtown. So what I'm going to do today, and I'll, my, my name is Rocky Marku, and I'm the commissioner of the Mar Milwaukee Department of City Development. I, I love slides because I think pictures tell stories. So I brought a collection of slides today uh, to really illustrate what the city has done in the past with TIFs, tax increment financing. But I also want to take some of the mystery out of it by showing you these slides. There's some complexity there uh, in some of these projects are very complex. Uh, some of them are a little less complex. But really, ultimately, what TIF comes down to is actually really simple. And, I, I, and all of you, I encourage you to keep eating. We're, we're at, I want to get the address right here. We're at 2230 Historic Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive at Jules Caribbean. So let's actually give our hosts a, a round of applause. 
And the City Channel is actually videotaping this, so for our viewers at home, if you want to have a great sit-down meal, come to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive and come to Jules Caribbean, because you'll have great food and great ambiance. So thank you again uh, to our hosts, and thank you again to all the women cogs for her ongoing commitment to Bronzeville Week, which really every year it gets better and better. So we'll start with the globe, and that's actually a good place to start. There's Milwaukee, and there's approximately where we are on the globe. Uh, that's important because the Democratic National Convention's coming to town, as we all know. And we're pre all of us should be very, very excited about this, and I think everyone is. Uh, it's really going to give Milwaukee a global audience, an audience that we have not seen before. Folks, a lot of the folks that will be coming to our city have never been to Milwaukee. And it's not that they necessarily have a bad opinion of Milwaukee, they just don't have an opinion. They haven't been here. And I think they're gonna, when they get here, they're gonna be surprised in a very good way at what a great city we have and our people. So we're all looking forward to that. But let's stop with the basic fundamental idea of what TIF is. Tax increment financing is actually a tool. It's a tool that was given to the city uh, for that matter, any municipality in the state of Wisconsin in the late 70s by the Wisconsin legislature. And many places around the country have similar tools. They work about the same way. It's really based on a very simple presence. The, the, the premise is, let's take a look at the bottom of the slide. This is the existing tax base. So pick any piece of ground that you want in the city. Either a vacant lot, perhaps one of our Bronzeville lots that we have, up on, on North Avenue right now uh, that we're RFPing. Take either a vacant lot or you could take an improved lot, where we say something that has something built on it. Whatever the taxes are, I mean, pick a number. For the sake of this uh, slide, we use the number 1,000. That's the annual taxes that are generated by that property. So don't even picture the property, just think, all right, property, $1,000 in taxes. That's the existing tax base. The increment, and that's where the I in TIF comes from, increment, is the difference between what that property was paying when we started the tax incremental financing district and what it's paying at the end of its lifetime. So you can see that's the portion of the slide that grows. That piece is the incremental taxes. Those are new taxes that have come in above and beyond the basic taxes that were already being paid. So when we do tax increment financing, we essentially freeze the taxes to all five taxing jurisdictions. So you have the city of Milwaukee, you have Milwaukee County, you have the sewage district, MATC, who am I forgetting? MPS. MPS, how can I forget MPS, right? Most, a majority of your taxes go to MPS, right? And it's a great institution. So those are our five taxing entities. They continue to get the same taxes today and 20 years from now on that tax increment financing district, assuming it's 20 years. TIFs can be different lengths in time. What we harvest, though, is once something is built, or maybe it's rebuilt, we have an older building that goes under renovation, or we have a, a vacant lot that has a new building or a series of buildings. Whatever those new taxes are, the difference between what was being paid initially and the new taxes is the increment. That's what we can harvest in order to use in terms of a tool. So we'll come back to the slide. Uh, I think I'd like to move forward and show you some of the projects that the city of Milwaukee historically has used tax increment financing to help actually get on the books, both for taxes, but in terms of development in our neighborhoods and in the downtown. Another, uh, another term that's also used uh, is TID, Tax Increment District, and TIF, Tax Increment Financing. It's essentially the same thing. The D in TID simply refers to the geography. What line did we draw around in order to make the district? The TIF is actually the tool itself. They are used interchangeably. You'll hear me, they have definite and distinct definitions. Most people, including myself, use them interchangeably. So there's really no difference between the two. It's just a matter of nomenclature. This is the Menominee Valley. The Menominee Valley was, had a lot of challenges, about 50,000 manufacturing jobs that had left in the 70s and 80s. And the city put together a plan, actually 1999, called the Menominee Valley Plan. 
And what it called for, amongst other things, was to remove some of the blight that was in the valley. So this is the 35th Street Viaduct. Uh, Miller Park is right here off the slide. Canal Street isn't built yet. So Canal Street goes right through there, but it isn't built yet. So what we did is we wrapped a boundary across this property. And we called it the Menominee Valley Industrial Center. And we invested about $22 million. So what the city did is the city actually put bonds on the street. They sold bonds to come up with $22.5 million. In this case, there was no developer. The city of Milwaukee was the developer. We took that money. We tore down the old buildings of the Milwaukee Road shop site. Then we rebuilt this beautiful new Canal Street, put in a 60-acre stormwater management park. And then we sold individual pieces of land to all of these customers. Palermo's Pizza is there. Over 600 people work there today. Badger Railing, Dursey, Taylor Dynanometer, uh, Charter Wire, to name a few. Also, uh, Inga Team from Spain. All of those folks settled on the land that basically had been given up for dead, right? Nobody was going to build there. Nobody was going to do anything. So the city moved, and it used tax increment financing. So if you look at, you go back to all these buildings, right? This is what we started with, dirt. Since the city owned it, there were no taxes being paid on it. So that we didn't have to worry about the increment was everything that would be built on this would be increment. So all of these buildings as they were built, each of them obviously taxes at a different rate depending on the size and the use. But all of the taxes that are used, that, that are, we gather each year from those buildings, we use that to pay back the money we borrowed for the bonds. So that's how tax increment financing works. It's based on the potential of a future development being successful. And once it's successful, we collect those taxes and we pay back the money that we borrowed in order to make it happen. So that's in the case of the Menominee Valley Industrial Center. This had no TIF dollars in it, but it had public land. Uh, the Common Council and the mayor agreed to uh, donate about 22 acres of land to the Menominee Valley Partners and the Urban Ecology Center. They built Three Bridges Park. They used our donation of land to leverage $25 million of donations from the private sector. And that's the important thing about TIF, because tax increment financing isn't the only tool, and it certainly isn't the only ingredient when you're baking the cake of a development. You have to have a lot of different other ingredients. We use TIF to fill the gap. After you've gone out and got financing for a project, you're probably putting money in yourself through equity. Obviously, all of the things that go into making a development successful, and then you come up with a gap. That's what we try to solve for with tax increment financing. Is the, can the city play a role? First of all, do you need the gap? All right, We're not going to give TIFs to projects that are getting ridiculous amounts of profit, right? We want to make sure, and but as a developer, and this is important for the developers in the room and the folks who want to be developers, if you're going into the development as career, it is important that you make money. So we realize that. The city realizes that you're going to have developer fees. You need to make money, otherwise you wouldn't be in business. But we also take a look at how much you're making for developer fee. So all those are important ingredients. Here's another project actually in the Menominee Valley itself. This is an old coal gasification plant that, that a design company, Zimmerman Design, and Harwood Engineering actually turned into their new headquarters. Now, the city didn't put any money into that actual project. What the city did is we built infrastructure. So we built a new road through this site. And we primarily like to do infrastructure because infrastructure is what builds the city, not just for a specific company, in this case Zimmerman, but it allows the public access through that site and it connects other portions of the city to that development. So we do like to put money in infrastructure. Back to the Menominee Valley Industrial Center, the city actually in the Menominee Valley uh, has spent over $100 million. Not all of it was tax increment financing. The, the, the challenge with TIF can also be the fact that there's only a certain amount of taxes that are going to come out of any given property development. The lowest taxed entity in the city other than the city itself, which pays no taxes, is manufacturing. Manufacturing is taxed at a very low level. The reason for that is Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin, sets the tax rate for manufacturers. And historically, because we have so many manufacturers in our state, 
low taxes on manufacturers were seen as an incentive for manufacturers to stay or to locate or to grow. So when we use it to do tax increment financing, we don't get a lot of taxes out of that manufacturing, which means TIFs on manufacturing is going to be a little bit lower than we would say on housing or on other types of commercial development. So back to the city lights, which is what this is called, the city actually put in uh, an extension of West Mount Vernon, and we will work with them most likely on the Riverwalk in the future. And this is what the inside of that building looks like after they did an adaptive reuse or a complete renovation. Here's another example where the city used a combination of two things. This is the old tracer yards. It's a DPW facility off the 6th Street Viaduct, and this is the Morton Salt. The city moved its yard off of 6th to get it out of the way of the development that Harley wanted to do. They wanted to put a museum down there. Now, we didn't pay for any of the Harley Museum. That was paid for by the Harley Davidson Company. What the city did is help prepare the land, infrastructure. So there are roads, and there was some environmental remediation that was required on this site. That's what we use tax increment financing for. And we're get getting that money back as Harley pays its taxes. The city gets back not only its initial investment, but also the money that it costs to borrow, or the interest, as all of us are familiar with paying interest on our mortgages. Another development that is with the city using tax increment financing is the Reed Street Yards. This is the downtown post office. This is the Reed Street Yards, which is right adjacent to the Global Water Center. So as the Water Council started talking about a cluster in Milwaukee around water industries, we wanted to have a place where water industries could actually locate. So what did we use tax increment financing for in this case? to build fresh water way and to bring sewer and water into the site. Once again, this was, a, this was pretty much an infrastructure play. Here's another piece that actually has infrastructure as well as a lot of other components for TIF. So if you're looking at this, downtown Milwaukee is off here in the distance, and this is Capitol Drive. This is the Tower Automotive site. And a little bit closer, Capitol Drive here, 35th Street, 27th Street, this slide looks south. So, this was terrible, right? This is, this is what pieces of Europe looked like after World War II. I mean, it was, it was horrendous, right? A lot of disinvestment. Many of you, in the, some of you in the room may either have worked or know people that have worked at A.O. Smith at one point in the past. A.O. Smith used to employ over 10,000 people at this site at the height of World War II. They subsequently sold their operation to Tower Automotive, but everything continued to decline and to decline. The city stepped in and we created a development called Century City. And what we did is we removed all of those old buildings that you just saw on the slide. Well, that cost money. We had to do environmental remediation. There was asbestos. There was a lot of contamination in the soil. We used some city funding to do that as well. And then this is the combined waterworks and Department of Public Works facility that we built, the city built, uh, you built as taxpayers on 35th Street. That replaced the Tracer Yard site that we saw earlier in the Menominee Valley. So a lot of these pieces work together. And at the time, the mayor and the council wanted to send a signal to this part of the city that we were getting ready to do something big on the old Ale Smith Tower Automotive site. So subsequent to that, we cleared all of the land on this portion of it, and then we built a building that is now owned by Good City Brewing. And they're on Capitol Drive, right at where Hopkins turns to about 31st. And then we kept one building on site, one large manufacturing building, as well as two smaller office buildings. That is where the Talgo Train Company actually does business. So right now, we are marketing this site. Now, the challenge with tax increment financing on this site is we've spent more money than we have taxes coming in. So because we have not been able to get manufacturers to locate here, the TIF is not keeping up with where it needs to be. Now we hope in time to be able to fill this with buildings that will pay taxes and retire some of that TID. But it'll never pay off the entire amount. We're going to likely have to borrow from another TID, what we call a donor TID. So you, you'll hear that term as well. That's a TID that's doing better than anticipated and would be basically take that money and use it to retire some of the debt incurred here. Also, getting back to how much it costs, we spent about $40 million in order to do the, the, the first phase of this. We were only able to get 
four, $15 million, or so a little under $15 million for tax increment financing, because once again, it's based on what we think is going to be built there, manufacturing taxes less than other uses. So TIF is not the answer to everything. This is Century City, the new sign there. Another place where we're doing a, a big emphasis right now is uh, this is Alderman Perez's district in the Inner Harbor. And, and I should say uh, Alderman Rainey is the alderman uh, at, or the older person at Century City. This is an area where we put a water and land use plan together. There was a private transaction, the old Salve Coke site, which is one of a, a very large, a uh, very polluted site that was on Greenfield Avenue right across from the School of Freshwater Sciences. And Komatsu is moving their headquarters there and they're going to employ over a thousand people, a lot of, a lot of uh, folks that are, that are there that will be moving into the city of Milwaukee in terms of jobs. The city did a number of things here in terms of tax increment financing. We tied it to the number of jobs. If the company doesn't produce the number of jobs, they don't get the TIF money. And we only pay that TIF money out annually in this case. So the city is not borrowing money up front in this TID, except for the Riverwalk. The Riverwalk we are, and that's about 15 acres, or 50, excuse me, $15 million along the waterfront. Another example, downtown, we moved the, the ramps that were there when the freeway was built to improve connectivity here at the lakefront, but also to improve development, to allow more taxable base here. So we moved those ramps over and we use money from the Northwestern Mutual Tax Increment Financing District, which is probably the largest TID we've ever done. This is the building that actually came down, was replaced by this magnificent building. The city did not borrow any money for the Northwestern Mutual TID. We borrowed no money. The company built the building. We refund the company about 70% of the equivalent of 70% of their taxes for a period of years. That's how they're getting their money back. But if that building didn't pay the taxes that we expect it will pay, uh, as the econ maybe the economy changes or things happen nationally or internationally, the risk is entirely on the company. That's what we call developer financed tax increment financing. You hear that term a lot too, developer financed. That means the developer comes up with the money up front, the city pays back the developer over time rather than the city having to borrow the money up front. That saves us from having too much money in our capital borrowing requirements. So what another big, huge piece that came out of the Northwestern Mutual TID is that this building was our first major building that had significant amount of human resource requirements. We've always had human resource requirements. They started off as goals. We then turned them into a mandate. All the women cogs have been a leader on this, as has Alderman Rainey and, and, and Perez, amongst others, the council president, the mayor, clearly. What we were able to achieve, and I should say we, Northwestern Mutual Life was able to achieve, is that any time we have a million dollars or more, this is now city policy, that is invested in a development project, that developer must have 25% of the total amount of work going on on the site has to be done by small business enterprises. And because we have a race neutral ordinance in the city of Milwaukee, it still generally is men and women of color, largely, that are, that are the SBEs. The other important piece is 40% of the total hours spent on the project have to go to unemployed or underemployed Milwaukeeans. And I will say that most people observing that go through the council said, not going to happen, it's never going to be done. A lot of people in the development community said, can't do it, won't happen. The council was firm, the mayor was firm, the Department of City Development, because we negotiated the deal, okay, we were firm. But in, in the case of John Schlefsky, who was the CEO of Northwestern Mutual, John said to the mayor, I am going to make those requirements and I'm going to try and exceed those requirements. And he was true to his word on that. They exceeded on both counts, RPP and SPE. So we had a great public-private partnership with this that actually reached deep into the neighborhoods for what was a downtown project, but it's paying big dividends. Northwestern Mutual is also the largest taxpayer now, single taxpayer in the state, excuse me, in the, in the city of Milwaukee. Here's an interesting piece. This is uh, a, a pictures that were taken at Century City on that, in the Talgo facility, which wasn't being used at the time. 
It's about 75 folks that were hired by Benson Industries, which is a, 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 a subcontractor on the Northwestern Mutual Tower. These folks are all RPP. So once again, either unemployed or underemployed Milwaukeeans. They were taught how to be glaziers, or basically folks that construct windows. All the windows on that massive glass tower at the lakefront were constructed at Century City, this is about 27th, just south of Capitol Drive, by unemployed or underemployed Milwaukeeans who were trained in a trade because of the, of the, of, of the, of the council and the mayor demanding that that be part. When you put that on the table as a requirement, people come up with creative and impactful ways to actually make it happen. And imagine the pride of someone coming downtown now and say, I built that building or bringing their significant other, their children, and say, I help contribute to that building. So it's about building community as well. This is the projects that potentially could be built downtown. The Couture is one of them. This is the Northwestern Mutual Building. The city also put out about $24 million in infrastructure, not for the Northwestern Mutual Building, but to redo this whole area of Lincoln Memorial Drive, to connect it with Clybourne, and to allow a new entrance into the Third Ward, which should turn into, over time, billions of dollars a taxable base. Manpower, we used the Tax Increment Financing District to bring this company downtown in 2005. The beauty of the Manpower TID is it is now throwing off more money than we had anticipated, mean, meaning that company's paying more taxes than we originally anticipated. That's a big way for us to pay for the streetcar coming to Bronzeville. Coming north on Dr. MLK Jr. Drive, we will be using some of the excess money generated by this development as well as the Park East. So this is TID 41. In our parlance, everything has a number, okay? But just know it as the manpower TID. So it's pretty exciting. This is uh, North End. We didn't put any money into the building. This is Barry Mandel's development along the uh, river at Pleasant Street. But we did help with the environmental and with the river walk. So these are other areas that we put money in. This is the beer line, taking picture from the air. This is all the, all the women. Cogs District, largely all the women Cogs District. This is what it looked like in 1996. No developer in the world was going to step foot in there. That's another reason why we put TIF into it, tax increment financing. The state was going to put a prison here. It was either here or the Menominee Valley that they were looking at putting a, a prison. And this is a planning effort that took place afterwards. And then we basically came up with a tax increment financing district called the Beer Line. And we built, we rebuilt Commerce Street. We put all those walls that you see in, the retaining walls. We brought in new sewer and new water. And then we got out of the way and let the private sector do what it does best, maximize return on investment. There's $500 million of taxable base that's been built in the beer line. The city doesn't have a dollar in any one of these homes. But without the city investing in the road, the sewer, and the water, these places could not have been built. So that's the kind of the power of tax increment financing. PAP, similar, similar uh, deal there, given up for dead. As Joe Zilber came forward, probably about $50 million that the Zilber family will never see. That was an investment, a legacy investment in this site. Uh, the city's put up about $39 million in tax increment financing, and you have a lot of new buildings. You also have a lot of older buildings that were redone. Just up the street from Paps and just down the street from where we are today on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company also had some tax increment financing assistance as it moved through on infrastructure and some other uh, environmental and river walk. This is the Park East Freeway. Long, long time marker between downtown Milwaukee Central Business District and the near north side. It was as much a physical barrier as it was a psychological barrier, basically saying to folks, don't go north of the Park East, and if you live north of the Park East, don't come downtown. So shame on this city. Shame on where we have come from in terms of how these things got built, why they got built, why I-43 ripped through the African-American community, why the redevelopment plan of Walnut okay, eviscerated what was the original Bronzeville. But we can use some of our creative financing strategies to fix some of this. One of them was to tear down the Park East Freeway. We used tax increment financing for most of that, including the establishment of the new McKinley Boulevard and giving a seamless transition now north and south. Where the circle is on the map, of course, Pfizer Forum. The city also used tax increment financing to assist this development to move forward. 
The river walk, 25 years of investments along the river. This is what the river looked like 25 years ago. Not too pretty. This is what the river looks like today. And we are increasing that, not just on the Menominee or the Milwaukee River, but we're extending that to the Menominee River and to the Kinnickinnick River. And the river walk is a public right of way where everybody can enjoy. So basically a public street. This is the downtown post, uh, uh, this downtown post office right here. This is the, what was the intermodal station. Not very attractive. We use tax increment financing to put a new face on that. Uh, the mayor. Uh, this is a, 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 a picture of the hop as it arrived in our city, our new streetcar. The mayor did a press conference on that. Uh, as you look at folks that are building the hop, they look like the folks who live in our city because once again, we have the same requirements on the, on the contractors that are building the hop. At uh, Val Phillips, this is Fifth Street, Val Phillips Avenue, Wisconsin Avenue. We're hoping to build a new transit-oriented development hub here with the streetcar, bus rapid transit, and there'll be a beautiful new a development here that will be dedicated after Val Phillips. It's Val Phillips Plaza. So this great uh, civil rights icon who is a Milwaukee product with a national reputation will be honored here. Uh, that obviously is part of the streetcar moving north as well. This is not the picture of it. This is an older picture, but it's going to be a very beautiful plaza uh, between Val Phillips and Fifth. These are some housing developments that were former office buildings that had basically gone into disrepair that were redone. Uh, one in particular that I'm fond of is Kaylin Haywood from the, from, uh, from the Haywood Group. This is the Germania building, uh, once a, a, a very huge landmark in downtown Milwaukee, a home of the, one of the largest uh, German language newspapers in the United States at one point. But it turned into really a Class C office building. Kaylin came along and completely redid it. It's about 50% affordable housing, 50% market rate housing. We put a tax increment financing district in place to give Kalen a hand with this. And I think what's interesting here, there's a picture of Kalen walking by where, what at the time were his offices saying, hey, would group, that's his mother. Looking at that with obviously a sense of pride. This was on opening night. What I take out of the picture, and I took it, was the amazing thing, Kalen Haywood, a person of color, not really welcome in downtown Milwaukee when that building was in its heyday is now not only redeveloping that building, but has his offices there. So it's, it's a very, very strong statement on what we can do if we put our minds down to it and we recognize the potential of great leaders that are emerging in this city. This is first in Greenfield. We did Freshwater Plaza here, working with Alderman Perez. Stu Angard was a developer. 27th in Wisconsin, more examples, not this building, but the building that was here before that we tore down. We used TIF for that, as well as the gas station to tear that down. Bronzeville, which obviously we're in, in the heart of Bronzeville today. We have a district in Bronzeville that actually wraps around North Avenue, a little bit north, a little bit south. We use that to do the initial streetscaping. We did a, a couple of other improvements with it as well. But the big emphasis in Bronzeville moving forward is individual projects such as Melissa Goins, an Acre grad, a person of color who has been a great leader in this community and continues to do great things. She just turned that into a beautiful new uh, adaptive reuse of the old Garfield School housing. And then, of course, Grio, uh, which is the home of America's Black Holocaust Museum, which is a national treasure. Another thing that we're going to be able to show off to the rest of the world at the Democratic National Convention. We put uh, tax increment financing into both of those projects. This is the third floor of the Garfield School. Uh, this is not, no TIF involved in this, but there's all the women cogs. Uh, you see Deshay, who heads the historic, uh, the bid uh, here on, on MLK. Kaylin's in this picture, James Phelps. I like to highlight this because there is city assistance in the form of low cost financing in this. So it isn't always just tax increment financing. TIP wouldn't have worked here because it wouldn't have been enough of a change in taxes. So instead, we invested with loans and some of our other programs uh, from the Commercial Corridor team. So this is an incredible opportunity to celebrate what the neighborhood didn't want, another dollar store, and all the women cogs led the way. And she listened to the neighbors, and she said, we're not going to have another dollar store. And now we have Pete's Fruit Market. So thank you to all the women uh, cogs for that. And just an incredible new asset that's born because people work together. The Tandem Restaurant. Also, uh, tax foreclosure. This was a city, the old Wally Schmidt Tavern. It's a city tax foreclosed property. Julie Kaufman and her investment team did an adaptive reuse of this in Lindsay Heights. 
Uh, we've got a lot of commercial corridor money in this. We don't have any TIF, but once again, other city programs that we can help. This was recently featured in the Wall Street Journal weekend edition about a week ago. Across the street, we redid uh, the Fondy Food Market area. And then this one is going to be a big tax increment financing district, the Old Milwaukee Mall, the, the Sears store at uh, Fond du Lac and uh, North Avenue. Kaylin Haywood from Vanguard Group, uh, actually from, from Haywood Group, has actually bought the entire block and he's going to turn that into a, the Icon Hotel. He's going to have a 20,000 square foot convention and gathering space here on the north side, which is dearly needed. And we're very, very excited about it. The council and the mayor have already put a $4 million down payment through a loan on this. And we're uh, getting ready to recommend an amendment to that, which will be in front of the council in September. So that's how development occurs, because you believe in developers who want to change neighborhoods. Once again, the challenge on this is going to be how much can Kalen and his group get out of this land in terms of new buildings? That determines how much TIF we can do. It's really a function of how much new taxes come out of a particular project. Uh, Sherman Phoenix, uh, we, we drew a map boundary around uh, the area on Fond du Lac. And of course, I think most of you in the room have probably been to Sherman Phoenix. If you haven't, or those watching at home, you must go to Sherman Phoenix. So Joanne Sabir, Julie Kaufman, uh, and there's dozens of primarily African-American or women-owned businesses that are being incredibly successful in what is akin to the, think about it as the Chelsea market, if you will, of the north side or the public market in the third ward on the north side. It is, it is an incredibly empowering, uh, beautiful development. We have a small amount of tax increment financing in the development, not a lot because not a lot of taxes coming out of it, but it's a very impactful development. We also have subdivisions. The subdivisions are basically paid for the infrastructure, all the roads. So you've got, uh, this is Highland Gardens. You've got Josie Heights, Walnut Crossing. I see Carla's in the room. She's done a lot of building with us in the past. Infrastructure is what we build. And then we have the private developers actually do the, the, do the housing on behalf of individual owners. Here's some housing that we've recently done, some with acre grads. As I pointed out before, the Garfield Grio that had about $1.8 million of city funding, not all of it TID. Uh, Legacy Lofts, which is the old Blommer ice cream on North Avenue. We did a $635,000 TID, total city funding there, $1.3 million. Welford Sanders Lofts on 4th Street, about 1.7 million in, in uh, total city financing. 704 Place, that is Brandon Rule, another acre grad. Uh, this is a neighborhood he actually grew up in. 575,000 on TID. Bishop's Creek, we did a $985,000 TID. And Villard Commons, we pledged 500,000 in TID for that particular development. South 5th Street, we put a TID on South 5th Street. We narrowed the street, so a lot of times we do streetscaping. This is Midtown. There is a TID already at Midtown, so we're trying to reshape the shopping experience there, uh, working with, uh, with the ownership. And this is a picture of the former Northridge Mall in Granville Station. What we're trying to do here is, obviously, we've come to an impasse with the current ownership. There's a raise order on that. But we'd like to see a major development come out of this. This is a picture of what it could be. It could be largely manufacturing at some point in the future. So, Lots of different slides that I showed you. I wanted to give you a flavor for what we use tax increment financing for. And once again, don't get lost on the, on the district terminology. That's really a geography. And that geography can be as small as one building, or in the case of Bronzeville, uh, it could be a larger ge uh, geography. But really what determines how much money we can put into an individual project is what is it going to bring back in taxes? Because this particular tool is completely limited by the amount of taxes that are produced. It can be a powerful tool. But as we go and use this in the neighborhoods where values tend to be lower, it's more difficult to get more money into a project. And it doesn't cost, if you're a developer that's doing work in the neighborhoods, it doesn't cost you any less to do it in the neighborhood than it does downtown. Construction costs the same everywhere. So your costs are going to be the same, but you're not likely to get as much in terms of new taxes. So we try to look at what else can we do besides tax increment financing to assist the development to move forward. Back to the ACRE program. Matter of fact, I've, I've, I've been uh, meeting, I meet regularly with ACRE grads. 
Um, just had two meetings in the last week, actually, um, or last week, I should say. Today's Monday. But uh, to me, I want to find ways. The mayor wants to find ways. The Common Council wants to find ways to uh, get Acre grads developing new buildings or redeveloping old buildings, because that's how we're going to rebirth some of the areas in our neighborhoods that really need that investment. So it's important work, and we're really pleased that, uh, that folks are taking advantage of it. And you don't have to be an Acre grad. If you're watching this and you say, I'm not an Acre grad, you don't have to be an Acre grad. All you need is a project, but you have to have some semblance of how it's gonna come together from a financing standpoint. We can help with that. A lot of folks say, where do I go to apply for a TIF? There actually is an application on the website. I, would not, I wouldn't want to waste anyone's money on an application until you actually sit down with us at the Department of City Development, explain what you want to do, explain your project, explain your vision, explain what it is that you want to make happen, wherever it is, and then we'll walk you through it. We'll tell you what you should be looking for. Now, we can't build it for you, obviously. You're the developer, but we can at least give you some guidance as to zoning and some of the other issues that you're going to be up against. Don't wait until you've got a fully cooked project and then come in. Come in at the beginning. Talk to us. We'll have you meet with folks in zoning or we'll have you meet with folks on the commercial corridor team. I take many meetings myself because I want to meet the new developers. I want to meet the emerging developers in this community and I want to try and help wherever I can. That's what the mayor wants me to do. Certainly that's what the council's instructed us to do as well. So those are important things. Also make sure that you keep the local elected official, your alder person, in the loop. The last thing any alder person wants to see is a project in the newspaper announced in their district and they don't know anything about it. All right, so I would just caution you to make sure that you get to your local elected official because they're going to be your best resource. They're going to be able to tell you what else is going on, what, what maybe some concerns they might have, or they might be very encouraging to say you should go full speed ahead. So I would, I would say that that's something that's very important. All right, so I've talked long enough. Uh, although we have plenty of time left, the food was great. So now you've had the food, you've seen some pictures. Uh, why don't we take some, uh, some questions from folks in terms of, of uh, TIFF? Or I can answer other questions as well around DCD, but since I think most of you are here to find out more about TIFF, it'd probably be best if we, if we kept the questions to that. You got a question right here? Yes. Ma'am. Is there ever a break even point? Because when you say that you have a five year, well, say for instance, 100,000 was, was uh, taxes were, were collected, but because they want to make a change within five years that they don't have to pay them, that uh, 100,000 right tax, I'll just use that as a figure. And then that 100,000, that's 500,000 that is not being collected while all this progress is going into play. So once that, uh, the buildings are created in whatever the entity and the money has come through to pay those expenses, is there ever a time when you get more than what would have been if you didn't have had lost the others prior to it? Yeah, so the question is, do we end up with more taxes sometimes after the development has come forward, the TIF's been paid off? The case of manpower is a good example that I highlighted. That's how we're going to pay for the streetcar coming north. Uh, also, we could have the option of simply closing that TID. Once the legal obligations of the, of the district have been met, in other words, the money has been paid back, uh, we, we generally like to keep it open for at least two years. One year, we like to do infrastructure or roads with it, roads, sewer, water that are in the immediate area. Uh, that may not have been part of the tax increment district, but are in the city's road program that need to be done. And then we keep it open for another year, usually for housing, for affordable housing. And that, that, that goes into for use in, in affordable housing. So we can keep it open. The length of the TIDs, and I didn't talk a lot about that. Most of the TIDs that I showed you, particularly the manufacturing ones, are going to basically run to the legal limit, which is, uh, about 27 years is the legal limit by statute in the state of Wisconsin. We try to keep them to 25 years, so we have a 26th year for infrastructure and a 27th year for housing. Uh, but those manufacturing ones tend to be long. The, many of the other TIDs are shorter, uh, but once again, it all depends on how quickly we can get the money back. Uh, the Garfield School is a fairly lengthy one because it will not tax high, and therefore it's going to take a long time to repay that money. Carla, you had a question? Uh, sort of similar to the same one. 
when you're doing the calculations for a proposed TIF, can you look at um, a TIF that's uh, generating additional money as a way to sort of backstop it if the numbers aren't coming in? Or does that TIF sort of have to stand alone first and then you can potentially borrow money against a, a, a TIF that's doing much better? So the question was around, uh, first of all, donor TIDs or TIDs that could be established with maybe knowing that you're not going to have as much coming in in taxes and could you use another TID to pay that off. Right now, Wisconsin state law is not designed to uh, put forward a TIF that you know is going to be what we call underwater, that isn't going to pay off. Um, so from an ethics standpoint, I won't do that. I will not bring that to the council. However, it would be nice to see a change in Wisconsin law that would allow us to have a TID that we know is going to pay back a lot of money, say a downtown TID, and be able to use that to put money from the very beginning in a TID in the neighborhoods. That would require a change in Wisconsin law, and that's something that you should potentially talk to your electeds about, not your older persons, but the folks that, that are at the state level. That would be a big tool for us. Uh, we do have, though, as I, as I uh, highlighted in the, in the uh, presentation, we do have the ability to put money into a TID that has losing money and doesn't probably have hope of ever paying off by taking that from a TID elsewhere in the city. So that's called a donor TID, and that is uh, consistent with Wisconsin state statutes. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the idea of having two TIFs generated at the same time one that could generate money for uh, the other one that won't bring in that many taxes, but it would allow us to spend more money is something that we find quite attractive. But would like, we would need state law to be changed to do that. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'd like to know if you have uh, come across any experimentation with tiny homes or contained homes. Oh, we love tiny homes. The question is about tiny homes. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the Mayor Barrett and Alderwoman Lewis just recently announced uh, an effort uh, on the Bacher Farm site, which is off of 60th Street on the north side, northwest side, uh, working with a veterans uh, organization. They're going to be sponsoring a uh, tiny house development and uh, with uh, geared towards veterans. Uh, so that we're pretty excited about it. Uh, we think there's a place for uh, tiny homes in the marketplace because uh, in this case, it, it's a program that's going to help uh, veterans. But in other cases, folks that may just not have the ability to pay for what are you know, the old standard size homes because of the cost of construction, it might be uh, more affordable to have a smaller home. So I think that's something that we're looking at and we'll work with folks as they come forward with it. The containerized uh, homes uh, are certainly a possibility. Matter of fact, we had a conversation before the, the program started about containerized homes. The challenge with those is by the time you get done converting a container, a shipping container, to meet the legal requirements of a habitable unit in the city, you're probably better off just building a tiny home. Now, if you want the cachet, if you will, of, of the, of the, of the, of the uh, container, then you can certainly work with it. But there's a lot of zoning issues we'd have to work through. But we're willing to work on that. We're looking at a couple right now. Other questions? Over there. Um, so, in regards to, so obviously, you know, development is, for the most part, a good thing. Um, but when we talk about rising, um, you know, taxes and things in the city, you know, very much so being limited by some unfortunate decisions at the state to only using property taxes and fees to be able to do stuff. So, is DCC, excuse me, DCD, and I know our woman Cogs is thinking about some of these things. Is there any type of um, uh, uh, processes or policies being created where, say, for instance, fixed income homeowners, elder black folks, elder Latino folks, elder people who work in industry, whatever, with fixed income, where there is a fund or something that can provide property tax relief for them? So. So it's a good question, and, and the, the question was really around displacement, and will the streetcar be displacing folks north or south, and, and what do we do about the, the property tax? There's really two, two kind of comments and questions in there. Let's start with the property tax piece. 
Um, if, if you're not familiar with it, a really good resource would be to go to the Wisconsin Policy Forum's website. That's the old public policy forum, but they've now merged and they, and they re, they're renamed the Wisconsin Policy Forum. They did a very, very good analysis of how Milwaukee uh, gets its income uh, in terms of taxes and, and other public, all of the public um, uses or public uh, sources. And overwhelmingly, we are dependent on the property tax and that has got to change. And that's hopefully something that Madison can address. The reason I like the Wisconsin Policy Forum's analysis is it doesn't just say the city is overwhelmingly dependent on the property tax. It explains how other cities across the country and peer cities of ours in the Midwest have actually structured their sources of, 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 of how they run their operating funds. So I would encourage uh, anyone in the room and certainly folks at home to, to look at that on their website. Uh, it's really instructive and it, it really explains why when we get our tax bills, we look at that, well, it's the single biggest way we run the city, okay, in terms of the taxes that we are able to levy. And that has an impact when there's new development. So new, we've got obviously a lot of new development here along Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. We've got it on the south side in the Walker's Point area. And the fear, as, 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 as was the question is, are we gonna displace folks now because they can't pay their taxes anymore because the property taxes are rising? Because, and why do property taxes rise? Well, property taxes rise because values rise, right? And for too often, we, the single biggest piece of investment that, uh, that someone in this country could have in terms of growing wealth would be a single family home or a duplex, property. And as that property gains in value, obviously that's money that you can either spend or pass on to your heirs. The challenge we've had in many portions, portions of our city is that property values have remained flat for many, many years, which has hit particularly uh, men and women of color in neighborhoods that have not had appreciable gains. They have not been able to achieve gains when they sell their properties. So on the one hand, you'd like to see some property appreciation. But older folks in particular on fixed incomes can't handle, in some cases, any increase in taxes. So we're, we do not want to, and I know the mayor's goal in bringing the streetcar north as well as with strong support from uh, the council and south as well is not to displace folks. That's why the council asked us to put forward an anti-displacement plan. As a matter of fact, all the women cogs is a leader in that effort. And not just a plan with one component, a plan with multiple components. So one of the things that we're working on right now in real time with MK United is the idea that we could create a fund, that Milwaukee United could create a fund that would in effect pay the difference of the increase in property taxes for people at certain income levels, right? And that's based on an Atlanta model. And we had discussions uh, about this during the transit-oriented development planning process. And now it's those discussions have gone to council and beyond to Milwaukee United, who's actually trying to raise the money. We think it'll take about $3 million to stabilize some of the near south and near north neighborhoods in terms of being able to freeze those property taxes for 20 years. The reason the city can't just do it is the uniformity clause of the Wisconsin Constitution, which basically prohibits the city from creating different taxable entities, right, or different, different taxable citizen rates. So it all has to be uniform. So this has to be a private sector-led effort, and fundraising is underway right now to do exactly that. That's one piece. Another piece is for any development project that the city is putting money in from this point forward, affordable housing, 20% of those units, the new units, have to go to people already living in that neighborhood. And, and, and the only exclusion to that would be if the certain zip codes, we'd be in violation of fair housing law, so it doesn't apply to every zip code, but it applies to a, a majority of the zip codes, north and south. So if somebody sees a brand new development, even if it's affordable housing, and they're living in that neighborhood, and they want to go in that, but they often don't recognize some of the people that are moving in, right, because they're not from the neighborhood. So this is a way for us to keep a portion of those units for neighborhood residents. And this is something that all the women COGS has crafted with us and passed the council and the mayor signed. And you'll see many more of these coming. We're looking at many different ways to make sure that we don't displace the very people who have been the leaders in our community, who have raised their children, they've 
they went to MPS, they supported the neighborhood associations, they were good citizens, they did everything we've asked, and we don't want them to not be able to pay their taxes and then have to move on. We do not want the streetcar to cause displacement. We would like to see additional value brought because that's how we grow the city, but not at the expense of the people who are living in the neighborhoods that it serves. Other questions? Yes. Was there a discussion about doing TIFs for single family and duplexes or clustering of city owned property? We've done, we did that uh, about 15 years ago in Lindsay Heights, was phenomenally successful. It was uh, the city homes development was a, a new family, a new, built, new construction development that, that had some subsidy attached to it, a lot of infrastructure, and then working with Walnut Way and WIDA, there were over 500 units that were done in duplexes or single family homes where loans, in many cases forgivable loans, were provided. We also did uh, some uh, funding on the commercial corridor on North Avenue. So that was a very successful TID, but it also depended on rising values. And at this point in time, we are looking at, in a smaller way, to do a smaller geography. The big geographies can be very impactful. They could raise a lot of money. But if we have another recession, like we had in 2008, all those values plummet. And that's what happened to a number of our neighborhood TIDs. The values plummeted. And then we had to reset those TIDs. And we can only do that once. So to answer your question directly, uh, there are the four subdivisions that I already had on the slide that we are actually, that we've done infrastructure, and those all are associated with tax increment financing, including down payment assistance. For those of you at home, there's $10,000 grants, okay, if you want to build a home in one of those four subdivisions. Uh, also, we will be looking and have been looking with some of the neighborhood associations on potentially doing smaller versions of the TIDs. But the real challenge with TIDs around older housing is as very little increase in value. And that's what you're harvesting. Remember, we harvest the increase in taxes. And so there, there's very little compared to new build. So it makes it a little trickier to do it. It generally is not the only component that you have to rely on. You're going to have to rely on some other mixes in that financial mix. Do you have a question? OK. Oh, you were just pointing out questioners. OK, <laughs> thank you. Other questions? They said I had till 5 o'clock. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> All right, some of you may have a burning question. Uh, I will be here for a little bit uh, after the presentation, but uh, rocky.marku at milwaukee.gov. Rocky, R O C K Y dot M A R C O U X, X as an X ray at milwaukee.gov, or just go to milwaukee.gov and go to the Department of City Development. Send me an email if you want to have a discussion around a project that you're looking at. I'll either talk with you directly or I will set you up with somebody from the Department of City Development who can help you and get situated as to what you're up against in terms of zoning and what we call city entitlements to try and make that a smooth process. Our goal is to get as many folks in our neighborhoods developing property and redeveloping property as we possibly can because that's how we're going to lift the neighborhoods. Ma'am, you had a question. Yeah. How many uh, projects is, that you anticipate is going to be finished by the Democratic Convention? The question was how many projects are going to be finished by the Democratic National Convention. There's a lot of projects underway right now that will make it. There are some projects that won't. I don't think, I don't think most developers, because that's only a week-long piece, unless you are a hotel developer, you're probably not going to pay the extra money to that it's going to take to increase your production to get it done by the DNC because it's only a week. Uh, so I would say that that's really the construction schedule that most of these development projects we're on will remain the same. You're saying hotels. Yeah, except for hotels. I think some of the hotels have announced that, some have announced that they're going to accelerate slightly because they were close enough and they can get the benefit of, of, of leasing all of those rooms or renting all the rooms out. Uh, other hotels have said they're not going to make it and they're not going to spend the extra money that it's going to take to get it there. So ultimately, I mean, the good news is that there's so many developments that are in the ground. And I think what's encouraging as well is it's not just downtown. You drive throughout the city and you see construction and reconstruction going on. And that, that's really an important piece if we're going to move forward as a city. So thank you very much. Okay.